Welcome to the 5 More Minutes Podcast. Happy March! Or should I say, happy quarantine month. Wow, friends, what have you... Can you even believe... Can you even believe... The drama that's happening in our world since the last time we spoke. Last time, last time we spoke, uh, I was in New Jersey, and si- that was like, oh my goodness, two weeks ago. And now, all my events have been canceled. Um, everyone is social distancing. But I'm gonna be real honest with you, folks. I'm really happy about it. I'm gonna, like honestly, I have gotten more work done in the last two days because I know that I get to be home for two weeks to get this done. Let me tell you, I'm gonna pump stuff out. I'm gonna finish this book. I'm gonna do my PhD research. Honestly, I should I should do social distancing every March because let me tell you, we are so happy. Um, my wife is busy cooking up a storm. Um, we forced uh, Compost Kate to come into our social distancing quarantine party um, because it's also spring break for her district right now. And her they were supposed to go to Italy. That didn't happen. So we are watching movies, having fires, not in our house, in our fireplace. Um, and we are eating delicious food. Yesterday, we may or may not have drank a lot of vodka. But, you know, vodka kills germs, friends. So, you know... Um, be safe out there. And so actually I'm learning a lot about this because if you actually look at the, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you have seen enough in the social media world, but you know, I didn't really get it at first. At first I'm just like, yo, it's the flu. I had the flu this year, you know, it was awful, but like, we really need to have these precautions. But actually what I'm learning is that this, it's not about the severity of the of the actual virus that's the problem. It's that if everyone gets it at the same time, it's a strain on the healthcare system. And I'm like, oh, okay. And um, I saw a tweet the other day, and, and I can't verify this, but, you know, um, they said there's really only, like, a little over 3,000 ICU beds available in Canada. Um, and so if everyone gets sick at the same time, you can see why that's a problem. And so uh, although I didn't understand... Why everyone was having a little bit of a quarantine um, end of world party. Um, Now I kind of get it. And although, no, we're not dying um, as as a species, but I I am now understanding the strain and the social responsibility we have to reduce the strain on our healthcare system. So I'm pretty... um, I've been kind of watching it around the world, and I think BC's rates are steadying um, because of the effects of the social distancing, so I'm pretty proud of our province, but I know that we have just begun the journey, but, you know, I'm just going to make lemons out of this, no, what is it? Lemonade out of the lemons, (laughs) because... um, I need I needed some time off to get some stuff done. I've been trying to do the work kind of on airplanes and on the side of my desk while other things were happening. So I'm looking at this as a little gift from the universe um, to, you know, take spend some time with my family and not watch sports. So Jessica's super excited about it. But also, like, really thinking about those people who um, were actually staying um, social isolated for, which is people who have com- compromised immune systems, which very much include many of the kids that we're working with. And so I think it's also a really, really good opportunity to reflect on, you know, just the privilege of health. And, um, you know, kids, you know, we're living this right now, but there are families and kids that live this every day. So, you know, don't hoard the supplies. Don't buy all the toilet paper. Don't buy all of the Lysol wipes because there are families now that can't access those things. And this is their life. This is their life every day. And so we need to honor that and respect um, that this space that we're providing them is allowing them to, to, to remain healthy. So let's do it for each other. Let's do it for our babies. OK, enough. Enough of the, the corona virus um okay i'm gonna tell you one more thing my favorite tweet of the week it says okay i have to remember now um oh okay hold on i'm gonna pause and look for it because i'm not gonna do it justice hold on okay i found it you ready here is my favorite tweet of the season what's the difference between covid19 and romeo and juliet one's a coronavirus and the other is a verona crisis 
So good. So good. Okay, that's enough. That's enough of the coronavirus. We're moving on. Okay, so this podcast, um, I'm interview- interviewing two uh, colleagues slash friends, as Layton calls them, frolics. Um, And these are two educators that I have had the pleasure of working with. Um, sometimes I'll do mentor, mentor schools where I will work with one school multiple times over the year. And so this is a middle school that I got to go back um, and work with four to four or five times over last year. And it was very cool. And so uh, we kind of kicked off the year with a model. And then I got to go in and do like some demo lessons and some co-teaching. And what I really love about this school is how, honestly, you got to like, you got to like give some um, accolades to Perseverance because um, Sarah is uh, the team leader for her support staff. Um, otherwise, I know when I was in that role, it was department head, but I like team leaders so much better. And Lisa is is one of her support teachers in this in this school. And so they're talking, but I got to say, like, Sarah, honestly, she emailed me, like, every month. She's like, hey, Shelly, just emailing you to bring my email to the top of your inbox because if I've told you about my emails before, you know that I get hundreds a day. So that's actually a strategy to all you people. If you haven't heard from me, just send another one. Just be like, hey, Shelly just supporting you here's another email i don't mind all email me all the times you want um so sarah she was just like we as a school want to do this we want to try this we want we want um some protein so they actually kind of came together as a staff and was like okay okay let's do this let's do this so um this school what's really unique about this school is that they have really because here's the thing it's a middle school and sometimes i feel really bad for middle schools because middle schools You know, you're dealing with a group of kids who are developmentally different than elementary, but they're also, which we know, but we also know that they're developmentally different than high school kids, but often middle schools or junior highs, uh, kids are taught like miniature high school students. And we know that like the research doesn't support that at all. Um, Kids in middle school need different pedagogical practices because of their um, development. Like they are dealing with so many different things than, than secondary kids are dealing with. So what I love about this school is that they really try to kind of take a step back and say, what are we doing in our school in, like as an infrastructure and how does that actually align to the research and pedagogy of how to teach middle school students? And so some examples that I think I've talked about this before is, you know, they really, really wanted to um, stick with cohorts. Uh, they really wanted to do a lot of project-based learning and, and really pulling in inquiry. But one of the other really big things about middle school is to have diverse groupings because often kids in middle school, um, they need more time to learn things because they're dealing with life and hormones. And if you remember back into your middle school days, um, if big decisions are made during the grades six to nine, that can change the trajectory of your life. And, and, and so they really tried to maintain diverse groupings as much as possible to limit the streaming because often kids just need more time. And so I know when I went to a middle school uh, that was a similar structure, they grouped all grade seven, eight, nine students together and we learned everything together. We learned math and teachers came to us instead of us going to teachers. And so we still had ex- uh, curricular experts, but uh, we didn't have to leave and we could stay with our cohort because the other thing we really know that's important about middle school is that kids have that sense of community, especially a peer community, which is very, very hard to maintain when kids are going all over the building for different blocks. And um, my other junior high experience was not that at all. And if you know that story, you know that um, I switched schools in junior high. And so the first the first school was very, very much like a small high school, which which didn't work for me. and doesn't work for a lot of kids. So what I love about this school is that they really made this concentrated effort as a staff and a community to kind of like align with this middle school vision. And the other reason why I'm talking about them is because if we're going to align to these middle school ways and how kids learn in middle, um, they also really attack their so their support structures um, to align in the same way. Because as you know, supports are not designed to be inclusive or collaborative because they're coming out of the medical model, which we're going to spend some more time on both in podcasts and in videos. But just to really be like, wait a second, you know, if we want our kids to learn together and to be diverse in their groupings, we can't can't just keep pulling kids out. So um, they made those efforts. So I'm talking with the department head slash team leader today and one of her staff members in the school. And they're going to talk a little bit about how 
um, how it's working for them and what are some things that they did with the, with the structures and, and how that's going for them. And they're talking about kids of all abilities. We're talking about kids who are gifted, kids with learning disabilities, kids with cognitive and complex disabilities. And so I think they're a really, really great team to talk with. So um, yeah, sit back, relax on this. I hope you are staying socially distant but happy in the in the sun that's out today. And uh, and sit back and relax and, and listen listen to um, my guests and our incredible conversation. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to Five More Minutes, everybody. I am your host, Shelley Moore, and today I'm at one of my favorite schools. I've worked with this school um, a few times. It's a middle school, grades six to eight in a district right outside of Vancouver. And then I have with me two of my very good friends and um, I kind of weaseled this into this, so they're a little nervous. <laughs> and uh, they're holding their sensory tools to make sure they don't touch the table that is squeaky. They're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> so let me Thank tell you. you who these people are. So <laughs> I have to my left, uh, Sarah. Sarah, do you want to say hi and tell me a little bit about who you are? Um, hi, and? What's your role here? I am the inclusion sport teacher, head teacher. I love that. What's your role? What's your role? Team leader of inclusion support. I think that sounds like a great, that sounds like a great role. And to my right, I have Lisa. Lisa, what's your role in the school? Hey there. Um, I am a student services teacher at uh, the school, and I also get to teach some music, and that's pretty great. Oh, that sounds sounds, sounds so fun. So when I was school-based, how we organized our support teams was like there was support, like special education teachers, and then like a department head. Is that kind of like? Yes. Okay, but team leader is way more fun than department head. Yeah. Totally, right? Because I'm on a team. Thank you, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so... The reason why I weaseled Sarah and Lisa into this amazing conversation is because um, if you've been watching the Five More Minutes videos, you know that this month we're talking about the layered cake of support love. We love Yay. cake. Yeah, we love cake, we right? Love cake. We love cake. <laughs> and, and rainbows. And rainbows and all of the things. All and the uh, this is a pretty significant concept because the layered cake of love model is really talking about... Uh, shifting support models in schools. And so if you know anything about special education, special education evolved out of the medical model, which is fix kids because they're broken. Is that what you were taught in school? Uh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's this whole idea of, and the metaphor that, that I was thinking of to help me understand this was, let's figure out what's wrong with kids, which is what as special educators we were taught to do, you know, assess them, find out what's wrong. And then they, the students go get the support that they need. And so I always thought about that, like, oh, they're going to eat from the cupcake that they need to eat from. And so what we're really advocating for in inclusive classrooms is how can we bring supports to kids, but to everybody in that community. And so it's like thinking about classroom support as every classroom gets a cake. And so the reason why I invited Lisa and Sarah onto this podcast is because Sarah has been at the school for how long? 15, 16 15, years. 15, 16 years. So <laughs> she's been here since the very beginning. And Lisa, how long have you been at the school? Just a wee three years. Three years. So we have like the bookends of basically <laughs> a shifting paradigm mm -hmm. that's happened, you know. And so my first question is Sarah, is for you. So you said you've been here for 16 years. That's a long time. I told her earlier, I'm just like, you don't look old enough to have been <laughs> teaching here for 16 years, but no problem. I see pictures of your children, and I'm like, are those your siblings? Yeah. No, I have a 20-year-old. You're very yeah. youthful. Thank you. No, totally. So my first question for you is, can you describe for us kind of this school? Like, what, like how many kids are at this school? Uh, about 330. 330. Oh, that's a nice size, hey? Yeah. That's a great. nice size. Yeah. And so thinking about your kind of support model, you're kind of the team leader. How many other support teachers work with you? Um, five. About five? And yes. they're not full-time though, right? No. All of our support teachers um, take on another role. So mm -hmm. we have a counselor and he also Got does it. some explorations. Yeah. Tell and me what's explorations. Tell me about that. Um, 
explorations include music and drama. Got it. Okay. Uh, foods and Because you're sewing. exploring options. Yes, yes. Love that. And so they all run through the got explorations. Got it. Got it. So okay. they do student services in the morning and explorations in the afternoon. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And that, that helps them to get to know the kids as well, Absolutely. Hey? Yeah. They know every single and kid. And so the then building. for educational assistants, how many are in your? Seven. Seven. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's a good number. So you're kind of in charge of how support is op- like like organized through the school kind of like your yeah, team I, I'm on the team that makes those decisions totally fair enough fair enough okay so here's my question when you started at this school 16 years ago <laughs> did it look like that no not at all so tell me like what like how when you first got here what did the support model look like um, I was a reading remediation teacher yep. um, and math so mm-hmm. I only dealt with reading and math okay, no, okay. you got no help in any other subject right um, and, Very common. Yeah. Mm-hmm, and the mm-hmm. reading program was a pull-out reading program. You had to have a designation from the ministry. And it was learning disability, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was maybe 10 kids that got pulled out every single day. And I did a reading program that was scripted. So it's scripted mm. even for me, what right, the teacher right, was right, going right. to say. And then what to yeah. us? So like no, like totally rigid. Yeah, it didn't matter who the kids were, who you were. No, totally. Okay, no. I could see knowing you now that that would have been very frustrating <laughs> for you. <laughs> Lisa's laughing because she knows. Um, well, that's a perfect example of this cupcake model, right? Yeah. Like you find the kids who aren't doing well in math and reading, and then you pull them out. They go to the reading cupcake and the math cupcake. Yeah, and then right. they get no support when there's numeracy in other areas. They get right, no support for right. that. When there's literacy or, or reading involved in social studies, right. too bad, it's so very sad. very separate. Yeah. Huh. And so, okay, and now, Lisa, mm-hmm. you've only been here for three years. Correct. Okay, so have you worked at other schools? Yes. And, like, are they similar to the cupcake model? Did you work at a school that was a pull-out cupcake model? Uh, very much so. I worked at an alternative school. Oh, um, okay. And it was a pull-out model within a pull-out model. Oh, wow. Yeah. Double pull-out. Double that's a lot. I'm trying to, <laughs> while she's talking, I'm like, what, is that like a donut hole? Well, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's like the What's wrapper the dessert? of a cupcake. Like, the, totally. Yeah, I mean, it like is the, it's a, it's a timbit. It's a timbit. It's a timbit. It's the donut mm-hmm. hole that's been taken out of the donut, mm-hmm. which was taken out of the bakery where yeah. the cupcakes are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Look at us making timbit. metaphors. Timbit. The timbit program. <laughs> But Hungry you know, now. you know. But I mean, like, I feel, I feel, I feel bad sometimes for Timba programs, the alternate programs, because like often they are created out of necessity. Absolutely. Because kids' needs aren't being met, and then they kind of get a hard time because they're, you know, they're segregated, but at the same time they're essential. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and the same thing with reading. Like, you know, often yeah. kids who need reading support they need it because they are so far gone past failure mm-hmm. that we're just trying to triage. Yeah. Basically, mm-hmm. right. And I think that I, I love. Uh, a lot of alternate school mm-hmm. models. Oh, totally. That's um, where I did all my mm-hmm. pre-teaching, mm-hmm. all my volunteering. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I do like sometimes the... Well, in my favorite year, year of my school was my alternate school. Yeah. And then so I kind of think, and I ask it, this, people ask me this question all the time, like, well, then what's your stance on alternate schools? And I'm like, my stance is that we learn from them. <laughs> They're doing great things. Why? What, what is what is so how about, alternate that's how about, working? How about we just learn from them mm-hmm. and make every place work for kids rather than the timbit down the road? Yeah. Right? Because this is kind of what we're getting to. Because if you think about the strategies you were teaching in those reading pull-out cupcake groups, mm. the whole point of this shift is that it's more than just those kids who are going to benefit from reading support. Absolutely. She, Sarah just almost put her head on the table in like, <laughs> d- like well, duh, but then she knew uh, she wasn't allowed to touch the no, table, no, and so she know. self-corrected. Okay, so so now I'm thinking, so what were some of, well, you mentioned a few of the challenges so far about kind of that cupcake approach. Mm-hmm. Um, what, like, yeah, what was the experience like for kids and like how, for teachers, for parents, like what, 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 did, what were some of the tensions? I think it's really difficult for kids to um, keep their keep their head up when they're constantly being pulled out of class. Well, especially they, every day. Yeah. yeah. When the concept is, if you're not good enough, you have to go to another class. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that kids know that they come they into do. middle school and they go like anything you can do anything, but don't pull me out of class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially when social like. It and peer, so it matters. It's, it's mm-hmm. their it's their number one. Yeah, no, totally. and 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 they never get the opportunity to see 
what might be mm-hmm. what might be going on. And so mm-hmm. there's that whole missing out thing. When you're doing a prescriptive reading program. FOMO. There's yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little FOMO. There's yeah. no projects, there's no fun, there's no mm-hmm. there's not it's just yeah. like you have to learn to well, read. Well, and if it was based on designations, then it wasn't even based on need. Yes. Right? So yes. I mean like maybe they didn't even really like like this is a conversation I have all the time about, you know, supports should they be attached to design desi- uh, like diagnosis and designations or should they be attached to need? But it's so hard because you can have five kids with autism and they all have different needs, mm-hmm. right? You can have 10 kids with learning disabilities and they have different needs. And then you can have a whole bunch of kids who have no designations but have more needs than kids who do. So it's a, pro- it's a problematic system it definitely of is. supports and funding. Okay, so here's my next question for you. So you're in this cupcake model. I can imagine from my own experience you probably laid low for a few years. Yeah, I was... Uh Probably didn't last long, though, me knowing who you are. Well, no, I wasn't a participator, though, right? Like, oh, I, I, see, I, was, I see. I did not feel, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't on committees. I didn't join things because oh, okay. I just kind of felt, even like as as a professional, mm-hmm. I was kind of othered. Yeah, that's, um, that makes sense. And uh, well, I mean, if you're following a scripted program, it doesn't matter who you are. Mm-hmm. Right. And also the the role of like, can you give my kid a calculator? And 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 sort right. of that like, I was the naggy. Right person and I just yeah. didn't yeah. yeah you're the adaptation police yeah right it's yeah. not a fun role to have it's like no. it's like how much people love parking ticket givers yeah yeah no one I likes was, them yeah yeah absolutely okay so then what was the catalyst like why why did your school decide to shift um we had a change in administration mm-hmm. um those are often really good opportunities right? well we just yeah. changed the way a whole lot of things worked mm-hmm. um and uh the question just started coming up around the table of what's best for kids. Yeah, yeah. And we realized that a lot of what we did um, could have greater opportunity. Of, of and I think this is kids. this is a really important point because I think a lot of things, especially in middle and high school, a lot of things are done because that's what's been done, not because it's good for kids. Or that's what they need for high school. Totally, totally. Like and in middle school, it's yeah, high school. It's I'm sure in high school, school, it's in university. Except, you know, and in university, you, who knows? Oh, yeah, right? no. And if you know anything about middle school pedagogy, you know that they are so far from just miniature adults or miniature high school students. Like, there is specific research around how kids from great, like from ages like 11 to 15, they, they're in middle school for a reason because mm. they're from a different planet. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like they need different things and than it's high a school great kids. Planet. It's a great planet. It's so fun oh, to live on. Grade this eight planet. is always my favorite. I know it's so fun. And so why are we trying to change that? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. So you have a change of admin, and so what were some of your kind of first steps to shift? Um, we looked at some kids that were chronic non-attenders, mm-hmm. chronically not. Um, one would say your outside pins. My outside pins, yeah. <laughs> the ones that ha- uh, behavior problems. Yeah. You know, you know ha- what to do with. You have meetings, mm-hmm. and every week you talk about the same, same seven things. kids. Yeah, totally, totally. Or, or the same seven problems, right? Mm-hmm. So we just sort of said, how do we address yeah. this? And, and, and so did you have, like, kind of, like, a group of people in your school that were all interested in kind of making this shift? Yes, the same yeah. ones that were in the meetings, right? Because right. <laughs> you get tired of being in funny, the same meeting. Funny yeah. how that works. <laughs> and I ask, I ask this because I'm, I'm, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking about my own experience of trying to shift to school. And like one of the first things I realized is how I can't, I can't do this by myself. Mm-hmm. I can't do this on my own. Okay, so you have this group of teachers. You're like, we got to do something different. Yeah, and it wasn't just teachers. I think that's oh, important. that's um, so true. It yeah. was admin, our youth worker, Ugh, our counselor. We just sort of said we are all spending all our time yeah. um, not in the same direction. And so. you realize that, like, you know, those seven kids and the resources that are being used to try and, like, figure out what to do with those seven kids, Mm -hmm. you realize that sometimes maybe there's more optimal ways to do this. Yeah. Like, you know? And we can have fun and they could have fun. Shocking. Right? It's amazing, amazing. Okay, so some of your first steps. So you came together, you had a meeting, and so, like, did you just blow everything up at one time? No. Yeah, tell me what you did. We targeted the, we looked at maybe seven kids. Oh, okay, okay. um, that, That were always in the meeting. Yeah. And we said, what makes them smile? Oh. How do we get them in I'm here? I'm in a tear. <laughs> and uh, so then we just designed a program that ran for two blocks a day. Yeah. Um, where we did what they 
loved. But they loved um, interests. Interests. And yep. then we didn't know anything about it. So then we all put on our Facebooks and things like we need a computer yep. teacher. We need a, this person. And then we added um, some some of their peers because, yep. it, you know, yep. they know that they're the seven. Mm -hmm. But if they're the art kids, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, it looks different and it feels different. Totally. Um, so they can make some of those So you kind of started with kind of peers coming to them. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then um, that, it, yeah, that was it just, just kind sort of, of evolved. Yeah, evolved. Yeah, yeah. And then we, you know, we looked at a lot of work um, on SEL. We did mm, a lot of yeah, uh, yeah, UDL yeah. work um, mm -hmm. early. Um, yeah, but just just the pulling them out of class and saying, no, this is important. Yeah. And and prioritizing what they loved mm -hmm. as being the most important thing you that know, they do in this building. I think this is a really good point because I think that there's a huge misunderstanding, huge misunderstanding, that inclusion means 100% of the time in 100% of the places. Mm. And if that doesn't work, then what happens is it just becomes this like forcing people into spaces and behavior problems explode, yeah. right? And so like, what I kind of like about this is you kind of said, okay, let's take a step back. If the classroom doesn't feel inclusive, let's take a step back and create a space in the school that feels inclusive. Exactly, because right? if they're not in the school, you can include no, them totally. in anything. You can include <laughs> them in anything. And so, you know, and if they're non-attenders, that totally makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay, so now you're, you're zooming out to make a safe space in the school. Sometimes though people get worried about that because it's really easy just to keep that as the safe space and not kind of go back and zoom in. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think the kids, once they made connections yeah. and once they made friends mm -hmm. and then started to exhale and mm -hmm. relax, then they were able to, yeah. um, they were happy to go back. Mm -hmm. And we designed it so that it wasn't a year-long program. Mm -hmm. It would be like Little chunks six of time. weeks or totally, four weeks totally. with, with this person or that person, mm -hmm, especially because mm -hmm. we had outside people coming in. Right, right, right. So right, it right. made it, mm -hmm. um, it limited it our amount It was of kind time. of like a little like... Like a, like a little therapeutic vitamin B shot. Yeah, totally. Let's 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 figure this out. Yeah, reconnect. So, when did it shift from really targeting those seven kids who weren't showing up at all mm -hmm. to a whole school shift? Um. Well, the next year we wanted to make it a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. and so we did. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, why are we doing this for? A handful. A handful of kids when everybody mm -hmm. um, wanted to to do it. Like some of the kids were like, "Well, why don't I get to do that?" Right. And and <laughs> but they're they're not non-attenders. <laughs> yeah. So, but then that's like when you make the what the non-attenders are mm -hmm. doing attractive to the attenders. Right. I think that right, also right, right. changes some of that dynamic and yeah. and and all of that. So we um, we made it school wide. Mm. Um, I think that there were some years that we blew things up mm -hmm. and oh my goodness it was terrible mm -hmm. we made terrible it's hard it, it's hard you it's know hard and, but i think that not being afraid mm -hmm. to just okay to that try. didn't work yeah 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 um and then trying again yeah um, so you brought in some of these kind of like interest and strength based activities into all of the classes absolutely totally yeah. yeah and did you notice that like did you like those original seven kids that you were designing for for everyone mm -hmm. like how was that like how did that affect them when everyone's doing it uh, they loved it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I think they liked it initially, like the the exclusivity of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, they they liked. Mm -hmm. Then all their friends could be there. Then totally, they totally. had made the connections. They were attending. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah they some, were attending. Like there you go, there you yeah. go. And did you still need that exclusive club? No, because we moved it to school wide. Right, right. Well, and that's you know, there's the bowling. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what do your outside pins need? Do that to everybody. Absolutely. Okay, so then we're starting to kind of get to this like interest and strength based piece. How did that affect your support model moving forward? Um, we we've had a lot of different support models. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's how um, you figure out what works, yeah. right? And a lot of different IEPs. Yeah. Um, and uh, we just with. In this time, there's strikes. There's all of this mm -hmm. other stuff going on. So we um, we lost a lot of teachers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we became really thin mm -hmm. in student services yeah. and thin. Well, especially in over the last like 15 years, like that would have been right during like 
All the strikes. All the strikes and job action. (laughs) (laughs) We're forcing to get real creative. If you don't know about BC, we had a little traumatic 15 years Mm -hmm. of of government cutbacks. Yeah, Mm -hmm. so we we had to shift um, kind of out of necessity. Yeah, Um, fair enough. But always keeping in mind, um, one of the things I think we do well is we always go back to what are our goals. And then how are we as a student services Mm -hmm. team meeting Mm -hmm. those goals? And are we meeting them? And... Mm-hmm. You know, and so where would you say you are now? We're in a pretty like it's mm-hmm. exciting. Yeah. So tell me, tell me a little bit about your your school today. <laughs> um, our support model looks uh, very different. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it takes into account. Um, it's trying to take mm-hmm. into account teachers um, yeah, because I think with the shift piece. into mm-hmm. inclusion, um, without the some of the training, without some of the wherewithal of what to. Um, expect how to react. Totally. All of all people of the only things. know what they know. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so that piece, uh, we do have some time. Our, our, some of our student services is dedicated to working just adult to adult with right. with um, teachers. Yeah, all of our, not all, most of our support mm-hmm. is uh, in in class. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have some alternative means of doing support. So we have project based learning. Right. Um, on Thursday afternoons. For everybody. For everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where t- well, teachers sign up. Oh, I see. I see. And okay. so they can sort of have an idea. They might have an idea that they might want to bring to a student services teacher or mm-hmm. a student services teacher might say, hey, this works really well with what you're doing in science. Um, right. Let's so an do opportunity to kind of do a project together. Yeah. 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 Love that. Um, oh, what else? So, so we're going to get to Lisa in a second. Okay. You're be Coming ready. Up. Be Coming ready. Up. So I'm trying to like explain to people about this idea of a layered cake where supports come to the classroom mm-hmm. instead of kids having to leave to eat the cupcakes. So, yes. yes. So you have this model now in your school where teachers you're mentioning like have access to you. Yes. To, to, to plan and teach and all of the support teachers in your school. Absolutely. And so what are some other examples of supports in a classroom that all kids can use? And Sarah, I'll start with you, Sarah. Um, we're starting to look at all, like, letting go of the support, the idea of, like, everyone can have a calculator, everyone can Right, it's not just for specific kids. Yeah. And that's a big piece of that, yeah. And then also what we're finding is we need to teach to how to use the support. Mm, it's my favorite thing right now. Because mm-hmm. we often give kids supports and then they don't know how to use them. And right. then we go, yo, you can't have that because you misused it. Right. It right? didn't work. Totally. It didn't work. I'm taking oh, it back. It's so true. It's so um, true. So I think that um, the staff here are doing a really nice job mm-hmm. of um, talking to kids about how and why yeah, and when to use strategies. the supports. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love that. Yeah. And so Lisa. Hey. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so, Lisa, you're also a support teacher. Yeah. Um, you're more recent. So, what are some of the supports that you see in classrooms? I really like my job because I have the opportunity to go into a bunch of different classrooms. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I get to see a lot of different things and how different teachers uh, roll out support in different mm-hmm, ways. Mm-hmm. Um, Which says a lot about, like, also the diversity of educators. Totally. Right? It's critical to acknowledge that. And to honor where teachers are in their journey of... Mm-hmm. understanding supports and what, what kids need yeah. and stuff. It's It's yeah. been really cool um, as a newer teacher to see mm-hmm. um, some teachers who have been in, in the job for 16 years or 20 years. Yeah, or, yeah. Um, and it's just been really mm-hmm. cool for me to see what that looks like and how that's rolled out. Yeah, yeah. And can you think of any examples? like? Yeah, I think um, one of the ones that just keeps popping up is like using a visual schedule. Oh. Is it going to be great for one kid? Yes. Everybody. But then everybody loves it. It's such a good one. It's great for me. Right. <laughs> I have one by my door. Keys, wallet, cell phone every day. Every yes. day. So, Lisa, the other question that I kind of have for you is, you know, coming into a school like this, like what has been your experience in like working in this type of kind of collaborative model? Mm-hmm. I definitely have fallen in love with it. Mm-hmm. Um, You're drinking the Kool-Aid. Feeling good about it. It's too. so delicious. Yeah. <laughs> It's been, it has been quite a contrast to where I was before, mm-hmm. um, and what I see is students thriving from it. Oh, okay, that's um, great, yeah. From a place of uh, of really, like, honoring what the kids can do mm-hmm. um, and providing support in class, mm-hmm. um, I think it really feeds into that pieces, those pieces of mm-hmm. belonging. Totally. Um, 
which I think is essential for learning to happen in any, any Absolutely. place. You don't belong, you're not going to learn. <laughs> T-shirt. I always try and find a T-shirt slogan in every podcast. Oh, let's make some. Yeah. Right? Totally. I, I'd wear that T-shirt. <laughs> I would wear that T-shirt. So yeah, then... Honey. So here's my question, though, because I know people are probably thinking this, is do you have allocated time in classrooms, or is it kind of, like, fluid? Like, are you grade-based? Are you... Team-based. Team-based. So you kind of decide so, as a team so where to no, go. No, no, no. Sorry. We have three teams in the school. Oh, I see. And I so see. so we have one student services person attached to each team just to be able oh, to keep track of it. because we are doing a full inclusion model. So yeah, there's yeah. ELL kids. There's there's mm-hmm. there's all different kinds of kids and keeping track of who you need to go to. So is it grade-based? Like, is there a team for each grade? No. we our, All our teams are six, seven, and eight. <gasps> Even in diverse grades? Even in diverse <laughs> grades. And so where do teachers fit with it? Like, does, do teachers have, like, a team that they're kind of connected to? Yes. Got so each it. support teacher is supporting... Um, like a caseload of teachers almost. Yeah. Which kind of is, like, this thing that I realized early in my career. That Like, I remember the day that I realized that it's in an, in an inclusive model, it's less about advocating for kids on my caseload and more about advocating for teachers on my ki- mm-hmm. like it's, yes. it's really shifting like I'm here to support teachers to support kids as opposed to I'm here to to just support the kids in that classroom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if teachers have what they need, mm-hmm. they're going to be inclu- they're, they're oh, going to embrace inclusion. I totally inclusion. agree. I totally agree. And I think that often if there is pushback, I really don't believe that people don't believe mm-hmm. in inclusion. Like if I, I believe if people are pushing back, it's because they don't know what to do. They don't understand or have access to the support to do it, you know, and I think that, you know, what's a really nice about the example that you guys are sharing is, you know, it took time, A, mm-hmm. this was a, a responsive model of let's try this, that didn't work, okay, let's adjust, like it's, you, you basically have lived the inquiry cycle with the question of how can we meet the needs of our kids better? All of our kids. All of our kids, yeah. and when you realize that, like, yes, mistakes are going to happen, and yes, there's going to be hard years, and... But I think at the end of the day, I would so much rather a school go through the blood, sweat, tears, but also celebration of changing versus relying on that we do this because that's what's been done because that's the model of this school yeah. as your population may may not follow, right? And I think one thing that also that uh, we are student services teachers um, in this building, but I think everybody mm-hmm. in this building, teachers... Sometimes we'll switch the roles where teachers have to be the support teachers and right, we as student right. services will deliver the lesson. Um, I think that um, all of the educational assistants, um, our secretaries, everybody has a role yeah. in that inclusion piece. Absolutely. Whether it be they've picked up certain children and they just have special relationships with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but everybody in this building mm-hmm. contributes. And you have a connection to that common vision or common goal. Yeah. That's what, when I worked at this school with you guys, that's one thing that I really picked up on was everyone was in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, everyone understands why it's happening. Like, it really, I don't ever feel the sense that this was just, like, a top-down decision that was dropped on people. Like, you guys, you guys figured it out. Yeah. And uh, you, yeah. you can't have inclusion and say, we're including all the teachers. Right. You you have right? you have to you <laughs> have to include the teachers too. You have yeah. to include the teachers, you have to include the educational assistants, everybody. you have to include everybody who mm. has a part a stake in this building. Absolutely. Because we're all stakeholders yeah. here and, and we should all have a And voice. you can feel it. Yeah. You can feel it. Yeah, yeah, right? Okay, so next steps. Because we've just spent like a whole 15 minutes talking about this like bumpy evolution of your school model. I can't imagine you now saying, oh, this is our model now. No. (laughs) Because the model is about change, which is exhausting and exciting at the same time. So what do you think? Like what's next for you guys? What's new tensions that are coming up? Um, I... I am actually, for the first time in my life, excited about IEPs because <gasps> I think that IEPs might actually <laughs> um, really have the potential mm-hmm. at this point to really support teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do know, n- not in our building, and mm-hmm. but in some other buildings, teachers are now doing the IEPs because mm-hmm. they are so... Yeah. Um, accessible. So just to kind of just to kind of give you some context, if you're not in British Columbia, there's been a huge, giant teacher inquiry project across the province that I have been very fortunate to be a part of, which is kind of you know digging into the IEP process because if you look into IEPs over time, you realize that they weren't designed to be inclusive at all. <laughs> 
They were. I don't they, even think for the teachers. Not even for the I, teachers. I, I've never. They've kind of turned anyone. into policy bureaucratic legal documents that actually aren't useful. So we've gone through a whole big inquiry about you know how can IEPs actually? I mean, if we're going to put the resources into an IEP document. Let's make them beneficial and useful for the actual teachers who are using it. So we've gone through a whole model and are trying out a whole bunch of different things. And I'm working on that book right now. So stay tuned, my friends. <laughs> Little plug um, about that IEP. And so uh, Sarah and Lisa's school is, has been one of the pilot projects for that yeah. IEP. And and I, it's nice to hear that to you hear you say that because. I think that that's exactly the goal is how can we use IEPs as a tool for teachers yeah. as opposed to an extra thing they have to mm -hmm. put on their plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 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 in in that process like just um I think for me my area of growth this year was like just I want to know every support that exists. Yeah. <laughs> I just I, 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 I want all of the I, I, I want to know all accurate. of the that's things. Accurate. Um, I've bothered Shelly a lot for it. I'll, I'll bother just about anyone who will um, give yeah. me tools. What um, are supports? Totally. What are supports? Mm -hmm. and, and also, just who are who are my supports? I think one yeah, of the things yeah. um, we have a great district mm -hmm. um, level support. We have a lovely parent community. So mm -hmm. just um, bringing them all now yeah. to the table. Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. What do you think? What do you think is next for? Your um, school. I agree that um, we have a really good shift happening um, within kind of the document paperwork side of things. Yeah, yeah. And I love that shift because we have been shifting towards this competency-based understanding right. of our kids mm -hmm. and what that looks like in support. Um, so I think, um, yeah, more inquiry into what what does it look like to support mm -hmm. um, based on competency. Right. And another little... <laughs> context information British Columbia has also recently gone through a curriculum change to competency mm. which isn't unique to BC there's this curriculum shift is happening all over the world so part of this IEP process has been how do we pull in those 21st century learning skills into individual education programs rather than just having programs that are preparing kids to be a 50s housewife and like have more time <laughs> if you're not doing four she's hours. so serious all the time she doesn't I even laugh that. at my jokes anymore <laughs> Okay, sorry, what did you say? Sorry, what did you say? Well, we I think you're so saying something great. Continue. Yeah, yeah. Please, please we continue. spend so much time <laughs> writing papers oh, that no one reads. No one reads. So not only yeah, am yeah. I making a 50s House housewife plan, yeah. but no one's going to read it. <laughs> and it's it takes a 16-page no, document. We were taking pictures of IEPs today, and we looked at like a new version and an old version. <gasps> one was one page, and one was nine. Oh. Size 10 font. Oh, no. it was. I think it was small. Size I think eight? it was seven. Ugh. I think it was seven. It Kill was me now. Kill and, me now. And, and yeah. double side, like, it's just too much. too much. Too much. And nothing about the kid. I don't, right. When I get yeah, the kid, yeah, yeah. it doesn't tell me, you know, mm -hmm. what's going to make them smile? How totally. am I going to get them interested in their learning? Right. What are they, you know. Which, if you go back to, like, the, the, the catalyst to the whole shift to your school, that's what got the yeah. kids, is knowing what do they love, who are they as people, what are their strengths, and yeah. move away from what IEPs have become, which is this medical legal document of all the things they can't do. We all want to be in spaces where people right? look for that. We oh, all want to be in I those know, spaces. That's so true. Okay, we've got our riled up. Okay, so here we go. Up. <laughs> so I think that what you you have done in the school, your team has done in the school, um, teachers, educators, educational assistants, administrators, parents, kids, like the, the, your whole community, I think, you know, if there's something that I want people listening to really pick up here is that it can be scary. It can absolutely be scary to try something new, especially at an infrastructural level. But what I see and hear from your story is that it's worth the tension, it's worth the mess, and if you learn about inquiry processes, you know that you cannot celebrate or grow until you've worked through the mess. Yeah. Right. And I think giving um, permission for people to be like, it's OK that it's scary. It's OK that mm -hmm. it's messy to live in the mess for a little while, because that's how you're going to get. And Brene, lead into vulnerability, people. I love Brene. <laughs> right. So then so then I would say, because you've lived it, I'm going to ask you both this question. Is there like because I, I get questions all the time from teachers and teams and administrators that are just like, how do we shift our model? Like, what would be advice to a school, a middle school thinking just like you guys say, what advice would you give them 
if they are thinking of moving to a layered cake model of support? They're speechless. <laughs> speechless. Um, I think that um, just because I'm, I'm kind of new to this whole mm -hmm, model, mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would say start uh, with goals. Like What's as, the vision? Totally. Yeah, yeah just that's a great point. As a, as a reference point to keep coming back to mm -hmm. and keep coming back to. And when things hit the fan and it doesn't feel good and that tension is there, mm -hmm. what are we aiming for? Totally. What's your anchor? Yeah. yeah and I think when everyone point. has the chance to be on the same page about that and mm -hmm. contribute to those goals, yeah. um, I think that can lay a really nice mm -hmm. foundation of like, okay, so we tried this thing, but it didn't work, so yeah. let's try something else, totally. but we're aiming for the same thing. And I love that you said that everyone's a part of creating those yeah. goals yeah. because that shared vision can't, even if it's a shared vision, it can't be put on people. It has to be constructed together. So I really love that. Okay, Sarah, advice. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I have an idea. Can I share? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that you started small. I love that you started with who needs us the most right now. You know what I mean? Like you didn't you didn't blow up the school. You didn't, you didn't like change everything at once. You took the time to figure out the tensions. You looked for your hardest to reach kids. You talked to teachers and parents. Like I think that you made the decision very thoughtfully to move forward. And once you commit to that decision, you just got to trust it. Well, and it gets, at this point, I'm a little addicted to it. Not the change, <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah. I, like when you see how some of these, what it does for everybody in the building and mm -hmm. how, how they see their value and their importance and their worth and their contributions in this building, mm -hmm. you just want more of that. You can't unsee it. You want more mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, like, totally. Uh, I, I can feel that for yeah. sure. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you guys can't ever leave the school. <laughs> I'll because, stick around. No, totally, totally. Well, She's got more years than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for spending some time with me today. Um, I know that you were nervous, but you both did great. If you're listening, give them a little double clap on three. One, two, three. And <laughs> I used to do it with kids all the time. It's my favorite. Um, but no, thanks for spending time with me. Um, I think the work you're doing here is phenomenal. Um, people ask me all the time about schools that I that I know of in the world that are doing cool things. And I often mention both your school and the district that you're in as one that I'm very proud of. And if you've been listening to the podcast, you know, when I was searching for a house, I'm like, what school district do I want my kids to go to? This district was like top five. Yeah. I love I love at every level of um, of leadership in your district is is I think something to be really proud of. And I, we appreciate your work that you've you've done oh, you're here. So like lovely. you you have uh, we we caught you before you were doing <laughs> podcasts, and so um, to have somebody to help guide mm -hmm. us on that journey because um, yeah. it can be scary and mm -hmm. it, it can be all of that. So uh, thank you for your contributions. Well, thank you. There you go. Okay, say bye, everybody. One, two, three. Bye. 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 so good right oh my goodness i'm like i want to have middle schoolers just so i can send them to the school and i'm going to be really honest with you when jessica and i were looking at buying houses i was just like where do i want my kids to go to school and let me tell you if if the airport was closer to this district i would be living there because i love the district that uh, the school is a part of their 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 administration um is so supportive of inclusion and and i'm realizing more and more the importance of that so um thank you Thank you districts who are supportive and thank you schools that are making these concentrated efforts because it is so possible. Okay, so Sarah and Lisa, let's talk about this. So this aligns to so many stories that I'm hearing from people, which is a couple of things. The first one is the power of innovation. When we are trying to be innovative as a staff and as an individual, what we're, what we're giving ourselves permission to do is to let go of things. And the reason why we need to let go of things is because we can't just keep adding things onto our plate. This is very, very much innovation is about trying new things, but this, these new things aren't just adding onto old things because a lot of the things that we've done for a very long time, we do because that's what's been done, not because it's the right thing to do or the best thing to do or the most effective thing to do. So what I love about this um, whole story with, with Sarah and, and Lisa and them talking about their school community is they gave themselves permission to evolve and to move and 
I'm seeing so much work in the areas of innovation and curriculum and assessment, but I'm like, come on, you guys, special education, we need to get some innovation in there too. And, you know, last, um, last, last podcast, we talked about um, the IEP and the book that's coming out on the IEP. And one thing I'm so excited about BC is exactly this, like, as a province, we came together and said, we need to be innovative in special education. And one thing we can do is evolve this document. Because so many things on that document we do because that's what's been done, not because it's the most effective thing. So, so this is another example, looking at your school support models. What are some things that we can do to start evolve and be innovative around um, providing structures and supports to um, our students who need them? Um, and students who don't need them, it's not going to harm anyone to be supportive. Okay, number two. I am also reminded when I talk to Lisa and Sarah is the importance of working together. I remember I tried, I tried. I tried to change a school by myself and it did not go well at all. I, I tell this joke all the time, but I'm going to tell you again because it's my favorite joke because it's real. But in my like first year of teaching at the high school <laughs> when I first moved back to Canada, I was just like, I thought my job as a support teacher was to tell people what to do. And so I got really passive aggressive and, uh, so we put all of these kids with cognitive disabilities in all of these classes, and, and I'd just be like, just listen to me, just do what I say. And people not only didn't listen to me, they ran in the opposite direction. Like, people would hide in the photocopier room. And I'm like, why are these teachers being so difficult? And so I'm like, man, they didn't teach me how to change people's minds in school. And so I went to the bookstore to do some research. And one, um, I saw this book on the shelf, and it was like the skies parted, because the book was called How to Deal with Difficult People. And I'm like, yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you for, for seeing what I needed today, bookstore. I didn't even read the back. I took the book home. I put my feet up. And sure enough, I'm ready to learn. I open up the book. The very first page in the book says this. If you bought this book, you are the difficult person. And I almost died. I'm a Leo. So this was like totally tarnishing to my ego. But it just, you know, as like that was quite a few years ago. And so I've learned to be much more strategic in my day. And one of the big lessons I've learned about inclusion is that we cannot do this by ourselves because you can't just tell people what to do. This is an initiative that's a community-based initiative. And it's something that we have to co-construct together because there also isn't one way to be inclusive. Um, there's definitely values and principles that we're aligning to but if we think that there's only one way to be inclusive then we're not valuing our own diversity um, as a staff and as a community and so this is some things that I've really learned and that, that we have to work together because we have to construct this together what it looks like in each of our schools might look different and that's okay um, and so part of this work is okay what are these these values and what are some like non-negotiables here but then how do we make this work for our kids in our context which is what I think th this school story is doing a really good job of doing um, okay letting go okay but here's the thing here's the thing if we're gonna do this we can't lose ourselves we can't lose ourselves by just making this about practice because this is what happens this is what happens i'm seeing it all the time we understand why inclusion is important and then we get lost in the practical details of it because it gets messy and then we forget why it's important and then we stop doing it so that's why these conversations are so important to have every year, every couple of months, you know, every week, check in with your people and be like, do we remember? Why is this important? Why are we doing this? Because we can't just stay in the philosoph philosophical side. We can't just stay in the practical side. We have to bring these things together, which means we need to talk about these things together all of the time. Why are we doing this? What does this look like for our kids? Ask yourselves those questions all the time. Because I'm going to tell you this, and this is what I really, when I hear stories like Sarah and Lisa, is that once you see success, once you see this working in your community with your kids and your staff, you can't, oh, excuse me, you can't unsee it. Um, and it's, it's like art. It's, 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 it's beautiful. And, and this is why I'm going to die on this mountain because I, I see the benefits and value of inclusion in the practical day to day classroom life all around, all around the world. And you see this and you're like, how can we be doing anything but this? And I'm reminded over and over and over again, and I can appreciate that not everyone has seen it. And so this, this work that this school is doing is, is one of those opportunities. Now everybody in that school can see it. There's seeing it and you know that is going to be our own little virus that was a bad joke but this idea of how do we spread it is we have to show people what this looks like in the practical side and so um go see it go seek it out if you haven't seen it um fortunately um this conversation with sarah and lisa happened a few weeks ago so i could maintain my social distancing and uh, so what are some other things i want to i want to kind of 
update you on. Okay, so the other thing that's important to know in the life of five more minutes is um, we have been invited to be an Amazon influencer. And what that means is that we can, well, I can create book lists, but I'm like, meh, whatever. Everything has to be done in collaboration. So if you take a look on my Twitter and my Facebook, it's everywhere. I've created a link for uh, Inclusion Amazon um, wish list that is basically a co-constructed wish list by all of you. You guys have been sending me things so that we can have in one place resources to see this happen. So I have picture books on there. I have professional books. I have books for families. There's a link to my books if you want them. There's also a what am I reading. So this is, I think the commissions are like 2% or something. So I'm just going to put that back into the podcasting. It's just another uh, source of revenue that we can kind of put back into because I don't want to, I don't want to ask you guys for money. So all of the proceeds for that will go into production for five more minutes and podcasting. And um, a few people have asked me about Patreon. So I did create a Patreon account, but you know, if, if you want to contribute, it's there, but I'm not going to make this about contributions because teachers pay enough money. Okay, so here we go. Check out the book lists. Um, this week's book that we highlighted was Joe Bowler, who's an incredible mathematician um, at Stanford. And she, no, she's not just a mathematician. She does so many things, but she does incredible work in the area of math as well. The book that we're highlighting is Limitless Mind. And um, um, someone I know, a colleague tweeted this, and I was reminded of a really favorite quote that Joe says. And she says, um, oh, you know what? I'm going to ruin it again, so let me check. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up my Twitter and just read it to you because it's so good. <sighs> it says, if you are not getting pushed back, you are probably not being disruptive enough. And so I'm going to leave that with you today. Go disrupt. You know what? If you don't have enemies, you need to get some enemies. Let me tell you. Because it feels good. It feels good to push the boundaries and push the edges because at the end of the day, it's good for kids. So here's our little rogue project. We're going to go. We're going to be innovative. We're going to push the boundaries. We're going to disrupt people's thinking. We're probably going to make a few people angry. But you know what? Good. That means we're going in the right direction. (laughs) This is probably going to come back to haunt me. Be safe. Don't be violent. And for the next few weeks, make sure that you honor our social responsibility of social distancing. Um, I know that I'm going to fully, fully enjoy this. And maybe next week at this time when I check in with you, I will have a first draft of this book that is now I have a goal to get it out by the fall. Okay, friends, you're amazing. I love you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I'll check in with you very soon. Okay, bye. Five More Minutes is hosted by Shelley Moore and produced by Paul Madsen. You can find Five More Minutes on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss any content. See you next time.